This video is going to be a commentary with some film included to illustrate my points about the Ravens electing to tag Justin Matabike yesterday with the, with a non-exclusive rights tag, rightfully so. Apparently, after both sides were unable to come to an agreement, the uh, Ravens had no choice in the matter. If you ask me, not sure how far apart the two sides are or, or were. And, and my guess is probably 3 to $4 million apart in terms of yearly salary, maybe a little bit less. I do wonder if it's maybe the overall length of the deal that is the sticking point as opposed to average salary per, per year. But who knows? I do know that there's just no way you can let someone with that talent and disruptive ability to walk away and, and only get a third-round comp pick in return without all exhausting all options to re-sign him. I'm sure that Eric DaCosta and Ozzie Newsom and the Ravens front office and everybody involved has, has tried, and it sounds like Matabike wants, maybe wants more money or maybe he wants a longer deal. Look, in any case, he's just too impactful and uh, disruptive. Actually, there, there's a better word than disruptive. It, it's destructive because he just destroys pass plays and run plays similarly. Is a very rare combination, I think, even in the NFL where NFL defensive linemen are incredible athletes and very intelligent and react and defeat blocks that they don't know, scheme blocking schemes that they don't know what's coming. The pass rush ability, I think, for Matabike was, was always there, but in terms of production, we only got spurts. Against the run, I think he's always been brilliant. He's always been destru destructive, and I've said that for the better part of, of two and a half years now at this point. I constantly refer to a game against the Vikings in 2021 where um, I thought he destroy, destroyed multiple run concepts to his side and away from him. You just can't scoop him on run plays away, run concepts away from him. But the pass rush production, which is the part that these, these plays are going to illustrate, clearly the difference in 2023. It's not just the sacks. And I'll, I'm going to make a, a larger point about this that – uh, maybe some other people smarter than me uh, can help me understand or can uh, put in better words in the comment section than I can here. 13 sacks in a regular season. That exceeds his career total from 2020 to 2022. But I think the QB hits is more of a telling statistic, and I suspect is one of the reasons why the front office is so unwilling uh, to let him go, even though they can't reach a long-term agreement at this point. So here's what I mean. The site that I use for statistics um, has him down as 33 quarterback hits in 2023. Now, coming into this year, he only had 16 quarterback hits combined, if you trust that website. But at least from the standpoint of using one site, I think there's consistency. Maybe it's higher or lower on both of those numbers. But for now, I'm going to compare 33 sacks this year with thir 33 quarterback hits, excuse me, with 13 sacks. That ratio, to me, looks sustainable. And here, here's what I mean. Let me explain. I know that other people are saying, well, I don't think he can have 13 sacks every year. Well, yeah, it's absolutely possible that he caps out at 8 to 10 sacks for the rest of his career or next year if that's his last year in Baltimore. But prior to 2023, he had eight and a half sacks to 16 quarterback hits for his career. So about one to two ratio, one sack for every two quarterback hits. Let's say eight to 16. So one to two, eight goes into 16 two times. Maybe I should have referenced it the other way. Uh, but in 2023, he had 13 sacks on 33 quarterback hits. So it's like one sack for every 2.5 quarterback hits. Now, I, I mentioned that because there's questions. Is he worth $22 million next year? Absolutely, I think, for 2024. Is he worth $22 million every single year? I think next year will be telling. I think it's a fair question for people who maybe – uh, don't expect him to produce like that. 13 sacks in 2024, it's possible he doesn't get there. I see, in, I see no reason why he can't be a 8 to 10 sack guy because of the amount of times he gets to the quarterback. It's not like his 13 sacks last year came on just 20 quarterback hits. I know that sometimes those two stats don't align, but I'm going to use a couple of other players as an example. Look at Clowney. Clowney has four separate seasons of nine sacks or more in his career. 2017 and 18 in Houston. He made the Pro Bowl those years. 2021 in Cleveland, and then last year with the Ravens. In each of those four seasons, Jadavion Clowney registered nine sacks or more. In those four seasons, he's got 37 sacks total 
on 80 quarterback hits. So his sacks to quarterback hits ratio is, is 1 to 2.14 or 1 to 2.15, basically. So it's a, it's a little bit higher than 1 to 2. Matabike for 2023 was at 1 to 2.45, meaning he gets to the quarterback consistently. We should expect him to generate sacks with more quarterback hits. Let's do a couple of other players, though. He could possibly have had more sacks in 2023, if you ask me. Let's do two more players that are more well-known. T.J. Watt, 96 career sacks on 198 quarterback hits. That ratio is one sack for every 2.05 quarterback hits. Miles Garrett, one sack in his career for every 1.94 quarterback hits. So if you were to look at Justin Matabike's 33 quarterback hits, in 2023 and, and compare it to those three guys I mentioned, Clowney, Watt, and Garrett, who admittedly play outside linebacker D-end or edge in this day and age is what people call them, you'd say he could have had more than 13 sacks. If he gets 33 quarterback hits in 2024, how many sacks would you expect him to get? I think it's at least 10, if not more. My point is the film makes it look sustainable. And from just a cursory glance that I gave you at the stats, the sacks to quarterback hits also look sustainable. Is it probable to expect 13 sacks with a new defensive coordinator and perhaps losing Clowney and Van Noy, uh, two guys who gave the Ravens tremendous effort and production? From, from that standpoint, you would say, well, probably not. To, to expect us to have so many sacks, losing Mike McDonald and all the veteran coaches that we lost, there could be some drop-off, absolutely. But Matabike gets to the quarterback. That's what he did last year. And the more times you get to the quarterback, I think it stands to reason, the more times you're going to get a sack. My final point about sustainability here, before I show some stuff um, against the run, is look at the sacks or quarterback pressures. They come on a wide variety of play types and moves from Matabike. You saw the quarterback boot in week one where he chased down C.J. Stroud ridiculous athleticism and burst. You saw the spin move against the left guard for the Cardinals, where with his inside arm, he's able to pin the guard after spinning off of him and then bring Dobbs down. And Dobbs is a difficult guy to tackle. It's just a violent play. You saw the five technique or, quote, edge rush against the left tackle from the Titans in week six. It was a straight-on bull rush. The Ravens had the D tackles and outside linebackers inverted on that play. It, it flowed through twice, I think, for you guys, maybe three times. He just overwhelmed the left tackle, walked him right back to the quarterback. Then you saw multiple examples of the classic pick stunt between Queen and Matabike, where Matabike is lined up outside shade of the guard, three technique, or in the B-gap. Queen smacks the guard, and then Matabike is able to stunt inside late after the pick and get a mismatch against a running back or a center who's in recovery or maybe he recognized it late. You also see Matabike running the pick himself at times and then just plays straight through that space, like the force fumble week seven against Goff that I showed you here, and then again against the Jags in, um, later on in the season that very easily could have been a fumble. you got twist stunts. My point in telling you all of these, describing them, is they come on a wide variety of moves. It's not like only one move with a counter off of it. Matabike is capable of doing all of those things. I mean, what else can we say? other than he's capable of doing them repeatedly because we have film of him executing all of those tasks. It's not like there's just one move that was utilized to get 13 sacks and 33 quarterback hits. I'm going to consider it or compare it, I should say, to a, a shot chart in the NBA. In, in my opinion, for Matabike in 2023, we got some three-pointers. You, uh, if you're not a basketball person, forgive me. It's an overlay, overhead look at the court, and you see one color for missed shots and one color for made shots for a player, usually it's a basketball, sometimes it's just a red circle or a blue circle. It's a shot chart. In Matabike's case for sacks, we've got some three-pointers, a couple of dunks, a handful of mid-range mid jumpers uh, from the elbow, 17 feet out, and then we got some post moves added in. That's something that's sustainable that you can repeat. There's no reason why he can't give us similar impact, a similar shot chart, if you will, uh, next season. Now, if you want to talk about the timing of some of the defensive play calls being different, there's something to talk about there. Uh, losing all the veteran coaches, it's more than just Mike McDonald. Losing all the veteran coaches, I think there will be a difference uh, in our defense next year. Not that we won't have a good one, but probably not historic like this past year. 
So against the run, I have said for multiple seasons that Matabike is a problem. This is actually film from 2021, the first two plays against the Packers right guard and then against the left guard for the Vikings. Um, but they'll be mostly filmed from 2023 here to illustrate his play against the run. It's no problem if other people didn't recognize it or talk about it. But you to combo Matabike, first of all, you, you don't single block him on the play side, as you see most of these clips illustrating that. One-on-one -on -one is the play side guard. you got a real problem dealing with him. Also, if you combo him too quickly, he's got the core strength and the, and the lower leg hip strength to be able to maintain his position and then redirect after one of the offensive linemen combos up to the second level. Um, I, I mixed in film from 2021 and 2023 because I don't think there's a difference between them in, in terms of against the run. Against NFL offensive line talent, he's the real deal against the run. And that is block recognition, meaning I'm reading the block, recognizing it quickly, and then I have the power, explosiveness to respond to it with the correct technique and win. That's a rare combination, along with the sacks that he generated in 2023. So from the Ravens' standpoint, can't blame them at all for tagging him. Maybe they're so close together that the tag is just a, something that's going to be a minimal amount of time because the Ravens believe they're going to be able to get a deal done. I don't know. I will say this, though. As the 2023 season developed, I did see a couple of plays where Matabike appeared to be anticipating pass and getting up the field more than reacting to blocks. Saw it in 2022 some from other guys. Calais Campbell was one of them. How many times a game? Once or twice, if that. How many games? Four or five. In Matabike's case this past year, that was not until later in the year. It showed up as the season had progressed. Now, it's also possible that that was the call in the huddle pre-snap meaning there was a call to focus on the pass, get up field, and in a couple of cases he got trapped. He actually got pancaked one time on a trap. Trap is where you're left unblocked, and then a guard or lineman from the other side pulls and executes a kickout block. I had not seen it in Matabike's case prior to 2023. I think I do have to mention that NFL offenses in 2023 seem to be running trap more uh, this year, so that could have been a factor as well. Finally, the athleticism that he off his ability to make athletic plays, along with being great against the run, finishing at the quarterback, if you ask me, is one of the other things that sets him apart from other D tackles in the NFL. You saw the track down of Stroud, who, who's no slouch as an athlete, as an athletic quarterback. And then his ability to get in passing lanes um, on these glitch blitzes is it's coached. And, and Pierce does it as well. They're both very good at it. It allows us to blitz the nickel off the edge and then drop out two D tackles. This is Pierce looking inside out. And then Matabike is consistently getting in the window of potential passing lanes for the quarterback on this, I call it glitch blitz. You can see that Millette is blitzing off the edge. It's a sack against the Steelers on a third down in week five. I'll run the first play back here for you one time. It's the playoffs against the Texans. Matabike there in the B-gap, kind of a wider three. It's a fourth and six late in the game. You can see Jones and Matabike getting out of here. Matabike consistently doesn't pick up receivers, meaning he doesn't turn and look. He's a defensive tackle. He's not coached on pass drops that often. But in this particular call, I think he's great at it. He generally reads the quarterback's eyes. This is the third time this year I've seen him get right in the window on that, that, if you will, hot, if you will, for the quarterback. In this case, causing the throw to be high. Well, I think Millette gets a big hit on C.J. Stroud. He's excellent in this regard, if you ask me. It's a great stunt. I do wonder, I do wonder however, if we're going to use this stunt less in 2023 because McDonald is gone. I would expect Seattle to have this installed. I hope we retain the use of it. Two defensive tackles dropping out into the hook zone, Forcing the quarterback to not get a hot route over the middle of the field, basically. And then the other thing about Matabike, and I think he he gears down a little bit in this play. This is him, and then I believe Jones or Washington in pursuit. He's terrifying as a guy who finishes plays, uh, meaning there's an impact to when Matabike gets there. He's explosive as hell, 
great technique on all the D-tackle stuff. I think he's got a team-first mentality. I think you see it in all the, the pick stunts that we run with him. But he's a finisher. This is one more example of the glitch splits, week three at home against the Colts. <clears throat> Hamilton blitzing off the edge. Matabike, again, ends up in the window of where the quarterback is looking. I don't think this is chance. I think this is all schemed up by the Ravens and coached up by the Ravens for one of the D-tackles to drop out and get eyes on the routes, and the other D-tackle, in this case Matabike, to have eyes on the quarterback and just fitting off of him. He's a finisher uh, in more ways than one. He completes sacks, tackles. In short, you, you just can't let a talent like this guy get away at all. It was fun to watch him. It was fun to watch the whole defense in 2023. I think it is brilliant. It's not fair to Matabike. It's brilliant to use the non-exclusive tag on him, however. I, I don't think I don't foresee anyone biting on that. I don't, maybe you do, and that's okay if you do. Because you've I don't see anyone offering him a contract. Because of the two first round picks they'd have to give up that's associated with it. That's along with the tag. Essentially means no one will make him an offer to give up that much draft capital. But who knows? Maybe I'm wrong and perhaps someone will. As it stands, if you ask me, he'll be playing in Baltimore in 2024. Just like all the other guys that were tagged on the non-exclusive tag yesterday, LeJarius Sneed with the Chiefs, uh, Josh Allen with the Jags, Michael Pittman with the Colts, Brian Burns with the Panthers, and others. I hope, my hope is, that next year he puts up another 12-13 sack season. And that comp pick is a solid third rounder if we can't get him signed. I think it's pretty amazing. I think it was a historic season for him, really. I think at this point, I've done six separate videos on Justin Matabike since week one of 2023. It certainly seems excessive when you put it put it that way. But I, I believe it was a historic season for the Ravens franchise on defense and Justin Matabike. Here's what I mean. His 13 sacks are the fifth most in Ravens history in, in a one-season number. The guys that he's behind, Elvis Dumerville was 17, Suggs, Bulware, who I think was 16, McCrary, 14 and a half. Pretty, pretty incredible company uh, for a defensive tackle, all of those guys being edge rushers. Uh, McCrary was someone who could kick inside occasionally at times. It's just too much ability, too much talent and production in the case of Matabike to let him walk after an offseason where we've already lost uh, so, many play so many defensive coaches and perhaps two really experienced outside linebackers in Clowney and Van Noy. You guys... Let me know if you uh, think Matabike's season was as historic as I do for this franchise. Uh, even across the NFL, I think if you look at other defensive tackles, the only guy who compares with the ability to destroy both run and pass concepts and give you that athleticism uh, is certainly Aaron Donald and then Chris Jones. I think Chris Jones is a little different player in terms of the range, being able to get out to people on the perimeter, like you saw the screen, the late screen against the Texans. And the ability to track down quarterbacks is unparalleled for a defensive tackle, if you ask me. You guys, let me know what you think of the video. The Ravens choosing to use the non-exclusive tag on Justin Matabike certainly seems unfair, just kind of just like it kind of did last year uh, with Lamar. But that's the business of the NFL, and it puts the Ravens in a great position if someone does uh, sign him to a tender, then the Ravens can match it or choose not to and and recoup two first-round picks in the process. I think his 2023 season warrants the salary that he wants. Unfortunately, it just seems like the Ravens can't give it to him uh, because of other salaries we've got on the books. Appreciate you guys' time. If you think other Ravens fans would enjoy this commentary slash film study, I did show some film on a loop, then please um, consider sharing a link out on social media so other Ravens fans can enjoy this video as well.